Well, good evening and welcome to the ninth annual Straight Talk series presented by Furman University's Riley Institute and Osher Lifelong Learning Institute. I'm Elizabeth Davis, president of Furman University, and I'm delighted to see a packed house here tonight. Thank you for coming as we seek to gain a better understanding of trends that are having a significant impact on our politics, our culture, and the future of our country and countries across the globe. As president of Furman, I'm gratified to see not only Furman undergraduates, faculty and staff, but also many interested members of the community, including our extended student body, the members of Ollie at Furman. <laughs> As you already know, tonight's program, Nationalist Fervor, Authoritarian Rule and the Future of Democracy, is the first in our three-part series on nationalist fervor on the rise in the U.S. and Europe. We want to begin this series by looking tonight at what we mean when we talk about nationalism, populism, and authoritarianism. Why are these trends so strong today, and what do they mean for the future of democracy here and abroad? Next week, we'll turn our attention to a more nuanced discussion of what changing demographics mean for those who have a strong sense of white group identity and who feel threatened by the loss of traditions and their long-held majority status. We will hear the varying, varying perspectives of three scholars for what is sure to be a fascinating discussion of white identity, racial attitudes, and the future of white majorities. The final week in the series, we'll look at the type of nationalism that is rooted in racist ideology, specifically white nationalism. That evening, September 12th, we'll meet in McAllister Auditorium to hear the compelling story of Derek Black, who was the godson of David Duke and the son of former KKK Grand Wizard, Don Black. Derek was ri a rising star in the white nationalist movement until he went to college. A liberal arts education and learning that comes from building relationships with diverse individuals were transformative for this young man where he came to realize that everything he had been taught as a child was wrong. You won't wanna miss this compelling story. Tonight, we begin our series by hearing from Dr. Bart Bonakowski on the rise of radical politics. What does it mean and why now? At this time, I'd like to invite Dr. David Fleming, professor of politics and international affairs and senior, re uh, senior researcher in the Riley Institute to come introduce our speakers. David. <clears throat> Thank you, President Davis, and thank you all for joining us this evening as we kick off the Riley Institute's Straight Talk series and celebrate the 20th anniversary of the Riley Institute this year. A great event like this doesn't only require your attendance, but also your participation. As you hear our distinguished guests today speak and think about these important topics. We ask that you text your questions for our guests to the number in your program and on the screen. We have students writing these questions down and they will read a selection of your questions later in the program as part of the Q&A. As a reminder, uh, please silence your cell phones as you text those questions. Our Straight Talk series on the rise of nationalism and its implications for our democracy comes at an important time for our nation and our world. The fact that we have a full house tonight is testament to the importance of this topic. Issues like populism, authoritarianism, and nationalism are certainly complex and can be confusing. However, we should not underestimate the importance of these trends. They challenge our identity as individuals, 
and as a community. Further, the rise of radical politics could threaten the future of democracy here and abroad. A recent survey by, survey by the Pew Research Center, including respondents from 27 different countries, found that the majority of people across the globe are dissatisfied with how democracy is working in their country. Of course, the United States is not immune from this sentiment. In fact, about 60% of Americans said they weren't satisfied how democracy is working here. Many Americans are questioning if our institutions are up to the challenges that we will be discussing today. Many are calling for drastic reforms to the judiciary, to Congress, and even the definition of citizenship. For mass shootings here in the United States, driven by extreme nationalist views, to debates, or lack thereof, in British Parliament about the future of Brexit. The topics we will discuss today shape our politics and will be with us for years to come. As informed citizens, it is our duty to better under understand the forces that have brought our country and the world to this point. We need to understand what populism, nationalism, and authoritarianism are and how they shape politics and society. Even for a Furman professor who is used to giving difficult assignments, this is quite the challenge that I am demanding of you. But luckily for you and for me, we have two experts here with us today that will explain these concepts, describe their causes, and examine their consequences. Shortly, we'll hear a presentation from Dr. Bart Bonikowski about the rise of radicalism in politics. After that presentation, he and I will be joined on stage for a panel discussion and a Q&A by another guest, Major General Christopher Ballard. General Ballard retired from the U.S. Army earlier this year after serving 35 years as a military intelligence officer. He has witnessed firsthand many pivotal moments in foreign affairs over the last three decades. For example, he served in an armored bank ba tank battalion in Germany as the Berlin Wall collapsed, and he commanded a battalion in the 1st Cavalry Division in Baghdad. After multiple deployments to Afghanistan and time in South Korea, General Ballard returned to the United States in 2016 to assume command of the U.S. Army's Intelligence and Security Command. General Ballard concluded his career as the Deputy Director of Operations at the National Security Agency. With a resume like that, you know that General Ballard must have had a great education. He holds a BA in political science in German from Furman University. <laughs> Who would have thought? as well as graduate degrees from Indiana University and the Na National War College. Given General Ballard's experience across the globe, we are very excited for him to join us tonight. Please join me in welcoming General Ballard back home here to Furman and thank him for his service. News coverage of politics today often mentions terms like populism and nationalism. But what do they really mean? Our next speaker, Dr. Bart Bonikowski, will help us to understand these concepts and how they may threaten our democracy. Dr. Bonikowski received his PhD in sociology from Princeton University and joined the faculty at Harvard in 2011. He is currently an associate professor um, of psychology at Harvard. Dr. Bonikowski has published multiple academic works on nationalism, populism, and the rise of the radical right. However, he hasn't merely stayed in his ivory tower at Harvard, which is probably a pretty nice tower. Um, rather, he has shared his insights with audiences across the country and the world, and has written multiple articles for the public, including um, some that are, have appeared on the Washington Post's Monkey Cage page, which as, uh, is a great resource for all of us. I really recommend you follow those. Um, Let's give a warm, firm, and welcome to Dr. Bart Bonikowski. Hello. Thank you for being here. Thank you for the invitation. It's an absolute delight and an honor to be here at Furman uh, at the Riley, Riley Institute. Uh, I've already had a uh, terrific uh, uh, welcome with the last few hours, and I'm really, really happy to be here. Um, before I start my talk, and I think the slides are still going up, um, I'm going to give you a little caveat. Uh, it may seem a little counterintuitive that someone who will be telling you about the dangers of the radical right. 
uh, wants to stress that he is doing so from a nonpartisan position. Um, but I am, and I want to make that clear. Um, what I'm going to be talking about is not a partisan issue. It's an issue about the stability and robustness of democracy, something that people on both the left and the right should agree, should agree about. It's ultimately about placing country over party uh, and the danger of what happens when that rule, that norm, that precept um, gets uh, destabilized. Slides? Oh, do I have to do that? Uh, I have the power to do that. Wonderful. All right. Thank you. So this is the talk. It's about the rise of radical politics, particularly radical right politics uh, across uh, Europe and the United States. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about, this is sort of the, the charge I was given, to tell you about what radical politics is um, and my take, my theory of why it's rising at this particular historical juncture. Um, it's not an ex exaggeration to say that if you've been following the news, and recently we have no choice but to follow the news every day, it seems, um, you may get the sense that liberal democracy is in a state of crisis. Whether it's the protracted negotiation over Brexit, which seems to be going nowhere, um, although it went somewhere today, um, or um, defense of academic freedom in Hungary, where the Central European University was recently kicked out of the country and has moved to Vienna. Whether it's challenges to the constitution and constitutional rule in Poland, the jailing, uh, imprisonment of journalists in Turkey, whether it's rallies, Islamophobic rallies in Germany and elsewhere, um, or protests around LGBTQ issues around Europe, which are tied in with a lot of these things, whether it's family separation policy and other um, homegrown American uh, issues, or as we heard earlier, whether it's white nationalism and white terrorism in the United States and elsewhere, Something is going on, and it's probably not very good. Now, these events have been accompanied by, uh, by a changing cast of characters in politics. So for those of you who follow uh, European politics, these faces will seem familiar. Uh, for those of you who don't, just realize that there are a lot of faces. These are leaders of radical right parties uh, across European countries who've sprung up over the past 20 odd years, and the cast of characters is growing. Now, these developments, the rise of these parties, is related to, in some way, to the phenomena that I showed you earlier. To some degree, maybe it's causing them, or amplifying them, or at least accompanying them. Arguably, and I'm happy to talk about this in the Q&A, there is a radical right uh, representation in the United States as well. Now, that term, radical right, is a technical term. It's a term used in the scholarly literature and political science, sociology, and other social sciences, uh, which I'm going to define for you. So I'm not just tossing it around loosely. Um, and um, the rise of radical right politics across all these cases really raises three fundamental puzzles, to which I will only start, begin kind of getting today. Uh, it would take a long time to really get to all of it. Um, the first puzzle is, what is the radical right? How do we think about it? How do you know if somebody, a politician, a party, is radical right or not? Second, why has the radical right been surging in recent years, both in Europe and the United States? We can go beyond the OECD and back. Um, we can talk about um, Brazil, we can talk about the Philippines, we can talk about India, but things get quite more complicated when we go beyond Europe and the United States in terms of the causal factors involved, uh, but we can do that. Finally, now that we know what it is, why it's surging potentially, what are the, what are the implications, the consequences of the rise of radical right politics in all these countries? So I'll, I'll get through those three, hopefully. The first one will be longer than the latter two. Um, why do we care about what the radical right is? Why do we care what its components are? Um, well, I would argue that we really need precise concepts if we were to understand the complicated reality that we're, we're tasked with looking at today. Um, and we need theoretical models that help, can, can help us explain these, these phenomena, not just in one case, but across cases, because as I showed you, this phenomenon is, is wide ranging uh, and cross cutting you know, across multiple democracies. Um, we need analytical cl clarity. We need the ability to measure these phenomena. Uh, um, we also need an explicit focus on both the supply side and demand side of politics, by which I mean the kind of political discourse that's offered by political elites, but also the beliefs that individuals hold when they go out to vote or protest or, or do whatever it is that they do in politics. And some understanding of the relationship between the supply and the demand. Why is that people certain, with certain attitudes vote for politicians with certain kind of claims at any given time? 
Um, we need attention to the contextual changes that are driving the resonance between these political frames and the beliefs at one moment, but not another. That's foreshadowing what's an important part of the puzzle here is that a lot of the beliefs have been around for a, for a very long time. And the political frames have also existed for a long time, but it is only now that they're resonating in powerful ways. We also need multi-causal explanations. There is no one-size-fits-all explanation here. There's a long debate in political science and elsewhere in the public too. Is it about the economy or is it about culture? Um, it's not one or the other. I think it's actually a, 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 a problematic binary because economic phenomena are filtered through cultural categories, but that's a separate issue. Um, but, but there are multiple causes why radical politics is, is surging right now. And, and the fundamental causes differ across countries. But what I want to submit to you today is they filter through very similar, similar mechanisms across all these cases. And for that reason, we need to be sensitive to case-specific um, um, uh, aspects of radical politics. The reason why Brexit happened is different at its root than why Trump got elected or why Orban came to power. But again, I want to argue that the mechanism through which these phenomena unfolded is similar across these cases. Really, I want to leave you with four arguments. First of all, that the radical right consists of three distinct elements. That is populism, nationalism, and authoritarianism. And these are three analytically separate components with different causes and different consequences. That nationalist cleavages, cleavages around different competing understandings of the nation, when made, made salient, are potentially the most important uh, uh, factor in explaining the rise of the radical right. That actually, if you look at attitudes in most of the populations that I'm talking about, they've been stable over time which is kind of interesting. Um, what has changed is something else, is the shifting discursive mix among politicians, the kind of claims they make. It is partisan polarization, that is the sorting of attitudes across parties or party families. The erosion of old identities that used to give people a sense of self, which leaves kind of an identity vacuum. And a newly resonant uh, combination of frames and beliefs in new, in new contextual settings. All of that together has made for the rise of radical right politics um, with potentially nefarious, dangerous consequences for liberalism and democratic institutions. So for liberal democracy, but liberalism and democratic institutions quite separately. They're two components of liberal democracy. Um, and also potentially negative consequences for how we do political talk around the dinner table or in the media or elsewhere. And as you can see here, I want to submit to you that each of the three components of radical politics, radical right politics in particular, has different consequences for these three aspects of, of democratic life. Okay. So that's kind of the front end. Now, what is the radical right? Um, there are a lot of concepts thrown out there in the media and in scholarship, populism, far right, et cetera, um, liberalism, and so on. I want to argue that really the radical right has three components. That is, components through which we can understand what the radical right is, but also figure out who belongs in that category and who doesn't. So the first is populism, which you've heard a lot about, I'm sure. The second is nationalism, and particularly exclusionary forms of nationalism. And finally, authoritarianism. These are three separate, analytically separate components, each with its own causes, different consequences, but they are bundled together in radical right claims making, radical right campaigns, and have some co uh, correspondence in, in beliefs. We should distinguish them, I would say, because of the need for analytical precision in general, with precision comes understanding, um, because of the distinctions between their causes and consequences. Um, and the fact that actually these, these attributes are not limited to the right. Again, this is not just about the right, although I will be focusing on the right today. There's populism on both the left and the right. There's authoritarianism on both the left and the right. Nationalism, it's a little more complicated. There have been plenty of cases of nationalism, of exclusionary nationalism on the left. In more recent years, they're more often found on the right. And that's an important piece. Um, and finally, distinguishing these categories makes it possible to dis differentiate between, say, campaign styles and governance styles. This is often a puzzle for people saying, well, Trump was a populist in the campaign, but he's, he's governing in a slightly different way. Well, it's possible to be using populist claims in one setting and then govern in a very different way once you're elected, or for that matter, to, uh, to, to campaign on populism in one place and not another, one time and not another. It's a very flexible way of doing politics. And finally, distinguishing these things uh, allows for a closer consideration of both the supply for, demand for, and resonance of politics. So what do I mean by populism? Let me start with that one. Um, I mean something very specific by it. <coughs> this, but don't worry, you don't have to read the whole thing. Um, uh, it's a form of political claims making. That's the important piece. It's not a deep ideology, it's a way of making political claims. And it's predicated on a fundamental moral binary between some sort of a corrupt elite and some sort of a glorified people. 
Um, and I say some sort of, that's a technical term, uh, because these are kind of empty categories they can fill in with different content. But what's, what, what is consistent across cases of populism is that the elite is viewed as m morally corrupt and irredeemable. And the people are seen as the true fount of political power. Um, it often involves a particular view of democratic representation. It favors direct democracy, it favors, and it's sort of skeptical of intermediary institutions. Um, and um, it's really sees, po sees po people's interests as incompatible with the interests of, of the elites, whatever the elites might be. Now again, I mentioned already that the content of the categories vary. So who the corrupt elite is can, is quite flexible. So it can be IRS bureaucrats in Washington, and often have been. It can be union leaders. It can be Wall Street fat cats, kind of a left populism, right? It could be Harvard professors <laughs> and intellectuals. Maybe Buckley was right about this one. Right. <laughs> the point is, these categories are flexible. And you can imagine what kinds of politicians might make which kinds of claims under what circumstances. But, but again, this is a way of making claims. And that's important because if we think of populism as a form of discourse, not an ideology, not a set of policies, then you can imagine a, a, a politician using it in one setting and not another, right? And that's actually what's happened in the past. Um, so I've done some work on this. This is a paper that was published uh, a few years ago that, that traces the use of populist frames in mainstream uh, political campaigns in the United States. These are presidential campaigns. And presidential candidate, candidates in the U.S. have been using populist frames a lot. In fact, Lipset, a famous political scientist, said that pop, you know, populism is one of the fundamental aspects of American political culture. Um, skepticism toward elites and a, and a kind of a glorification of the people. So populism is not inherently bad. It depends what it goes along with and for what ends. Uh, but what's interesting in this, too, is that the same candidate, for example, Nixon or Reagan or Clinton, can use populist frames in one campaign and not another. You can turn this stuff on and off. It's a way of framing political talk, political claims. And of course, uh, we do a lot of stuff in this paper to try to explain who uses it when. But the longer you've been in power, the harder it is to make these claims, right? Because you are the elite. Um, although it's amazing how, how uh, inventive some politicians are in f finding new elites to blame. Um, all right. In the Trump case, it's, this helps you understand, so beyond sort of understanding the, the trajectory of American presidential uh, elections, you can understand how somebody can be populist, that is, use populist frames while campaigning, and then do something different in office. And I would argue, and this is, this is a, something worth, we can argue over, is that Trump really ran as a populist and nationalist, but is governing much more as a nationalist and not a populist, because again, populism is a frame. That doesn't mean that populism won't come back in, the next, in his next campaign. I'm sure it will. Um, but you get the point. It can be turned on or off. It's a strategy. What are the implications of thinking about populism in this very specific, uh, what's called sometimes a minimalist definition? Well, one is that populism is not a deep ideological commitment on either the part of the elites or the people. It is not an identity. You don't go around saying, I'm a populist and I will vote populist. Maybe, well, maybe some do. Most don't. Um, right? But it can be used to activate other identities rural identities, working class identities, maybe racial and nationalist identities. Dynamic political strategy, and it's typically used by outsiders, by political challengers, because they have the, the most you know, robust claims to, to not being part of the elite. Um, and focusing on, on classifying parties or politicians as either being populist or not, which is what a lot of political scientists did for a long time, misses this complexity and dynamism of, of this phenomenon. It's not who's populist, who's not. The question is who's using populist frames when, for how long, under what circumstances, and why. Um, I should also add that populist frames, as I already kind of mentioned for the US, have been long widespread in the United States and Europe. They've been available. It just, they're not always used um, in the same way. Now, the question is why have these populist frames been effective now? Uh, and I want to claim, and I'll tell you more about it, that it's partly due to shifting context in the United States, but also in European countries. Uh, and also the way in which populism has been combined with other aspects of radical right politics. Now, in this view of populism, what's missing from the radical right? What's missing is nativism, xenophobia, racism, anti-immigrant policies, and so forth. That is not part of the definition of populism. It can go along with it, but it is not it. And also, these threats to democratic, nor democratic norms I've been talking about. That is not inherent in populism either, although maybe it's sort of hinted at. But you can imagine, again, the candidates that I showed you, the, the presidential candidates in the U.S. history, used populism and then governed as mainstream politicians. 
right? So there's something else that needs to account for the democratic norms being challenged uh, and institutions being challenged by radical right politics. <coughs> and those two concepts are nationalism and authoritarianism. So let me tell you a little bit about the way I think and, and, and study nationalism. Nationalism is, gets thrown around a lot, much like populism, often without much precision. Um, I want to tell you what it's not first. I'm not referring here to national identity as a singular, coherent set of principles, right? The kind of thing where you say Americans are individualistic, right, and, and you can go on about other countries. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about people's conceptions of nationhood, what they think America means to them and what their relationship to their nation is, right? It's kind of a cultural schema of nationhood. Um, what, you know, one distinction in literature is between ethnic and civic nationalism, and so it's really about who gets to belong to the nation and who doesn't. It's about symbolic boundaries drawn around the nation, and that's a very important aspect of nationalist beliefs and nationalist schemas. <clears throat> so ethno-nationalism is sort of exclusionary. It believes that to be a member of the nation, you have to have the right ethnicity, sort of ascriptive characteristics. Civic nationalism tends to be much more elective. Uh, you can become a member of the nation if you just have the right beliefs and kind of allegiances. And ethno-nationalism, which is, again, this central component, is not just about racism, although it is also about that, um, but it's often about this kind of inchoate frustration with, with multiculturalism, with cosmopolitanism, with restrictive linguistic norms, um, also known as political correctness. Um, it's really about a defense of a dominant group's place in, in a status hierarchy. It's often intertwined with class resentments, and often also at the level of individual beliefs, uncorrelated with actual exposure to others, right, to, to the, the people who are maybe excluded. So one aspect, again, of these nationalist beliefs, these schemas, these cultural models that people hold is, again, who's a legitimate member of the nation and who's not. And that can vary along religion, race, ethnicity, language, right? So for some, being a member of, of, of the American nation uh, requires a certain kind of religious belief. For others, it does not. For some, it's about being of a particular race. For others, it is not. Speaking the language or not, right? You get the idea. But nationalism is not just about um, who's in and who's out, what the legitimate boundaries of the nation are. It's also about what aspects of the, of the nation you find meaningful and are proud of, right? So it's kind of a domain-specific domain pride. Is it a, are you proud of the arts and entertainment in the country? Are you proud of the country's uh, scientific achievements, the economy, democratic institutions, and so forth? It's also about how one sees the nation in the broader world. Right? So this goes all the way from, does one think that America is the best country in the world? And what does that actually mean? Would the world be better if others were more like Americans? Right? This, this is getting at some aspects of what we tend to call colloquially chauvinism. So here are some different images of this, of, of the latter kind of uh, aspect of nationalism that I just mentioned. So it's partly about whether you're proud of the state, whether you think the state should be something that's celebrated or something to be afraid of. It's about the relationship between the nation and the state. It's about what does the American projection of power abroad mean? Is it about humanitarian aid or sort of being the policeman of the world? Now, of course, these are very caricatured distinctions. You can do both or some mix of both and maybe some that's necessary. But the point is you get sort of people imagine what America means and what it means out there in the world. So if you see the images that I just showed you as kind of indicators of attitudes about this different aspects of nationhood, um, you can imagine that these are arranged kind of relationally in schemas, in cultural models. So these are, this is just kind of a, 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 you know, a caricature of what this actually looks like, but you can imagine two different people or two groups in the country, uh, one that is really inclusive in terms of its, its membership uh, criteria, that's sort of celebratory of the state and has a very kind of humanitarian view of, of, of projection of power abroad. You can imagine somebody else for whom religion is a really important aspect of national membership, who's, uh, you know, for whom maybe language is important, uh, who is skeptical of the state uh, and maybe sort of sees a more forceful role for the country and the world. These are just some of the attitudes I'm talking about. And again, these are caricatures. But what starts kind of materializing are the potential for actual within country heterogeneity in the meaning of the nation. So that two people might disagree about what America is and what it should be and what it ought to do in the future. And presumably, there are more people like that. And all of a sudden, you start seeing groups with different beliefs about what the nation means. Uh, and I want to suggest that those end up coalescing into cultural cleavages. I've studied this a lot using survey data in the United States, but also across other countries. Um, and my research essentially has shown that there's a lot of within country heterogeneity in these, in these beliefs about nationhood, and actually quite a lot of similarity between countries. Uh, these are sort of different models of nationhood. Um, I, in the past, I've called them liberal, restrictive, ardent, and disengaged. Each one of these categories is essentially like one of those relational kind of frameworks I showed you. 
the different attitudes hang together to make up these four uh, clusters, these four components of, of nation, or these four varieties of nationhood. <coughs> these types of beliefs are patterned. They hang together very robustly. They're stable in their composition. They're correlated with sociodemographic variables. Uh, and they're rooted in everyday experience. And, and my argument has been in my own work is that they essentially uh, uh, constitute latent cultural cleavages in the population. That is, Americans fundamentally disagree about what America means. They have for a long time. These belief systems are, you know, are pretty robust. But these beliefs are often latent. That is, they don't motivate politics for most part until they do. <laughs> right. So they can be mobilized for political ends, and I would argue that they have been. Um, it is also the case that in my recent work I show that what you think America means is a very strong predictor of whom you voted for in 2016, both in the primary on the Democratic side, because there was a ver variation in, in nationalist uh, frames there, and in primary on the Republican side, and finally in the general election, even net of party ID. Now this is really important. It used to be the case, it used to be, not so long ago, in the 90s, for some of you maybe that's longer ago than for others, uh, that you could not predict what someone thought America meant if you knew their partisan identi identity. That is, if you knew somebody was a Democrat, you couldn't infer what they think America means. If you knew they were a Republican, you couldn't infer what they thought America means. Unfortunately, I think, normatively, unfortunately for the stability of the country, that is no longer the case. That is, by the early 2000s, and this starts after 9-11, doesn't start in 2016, um, th these different views of nation have become sorted by party so that it is now much easier to predict one's nationhood beliefs based on their party ID and vice versa. Um, so like many other issues in American politics, there's been a sorting across the two parties so that there is less for the two parties to agree on. Think about it, right? If, if the two parties can't agree what America means, that makes conversations very difficult. So what are the implications of thinking about nationalism, nationalism this way? Well, unlike populism, nationalism is a deep cultural uh, commitment. It is a deep form of identity, both for elites and for voters, often latent, but sometimes manifest. It's a crucial source of identity. It's one of the master identities, <coughs> partly because it's got a powerful collective logic that's been deeply legitimized by institutions, educational systems, uh, uh, political institutions, and so forth. Uh, similar nationalist cleavages are present across modern democracies, uh, but they're not always salient, and they vary a lot within the countries. And I would argue that for them to become salient, you need the right kind of conditions. You need the right kind of political claims being made in the right structural context. And one of the things that makes the context right is when other identities erode. Like for example, and I'll talk about this more, when labor identities erode, which used to give people a strong sense of self and collective, collective uh, community. Okay, the last one, and this one will be quicker. Authoritarianism is a third component of, of radical right politics. And this is really about anti-democratic governing practices. This is typically what happens when radical right politicians make it into office. If you believe elites, elites are fundamentally corrupt and if you believe that the nation should look different than it does now, you might want to do it against all odds, against you know, all uh, barriers by using authoritarian tactics as many people have. So it's a tendency toward violating political norms and circumventing institutions that have existed for a long time in the interest of maintaining power for oneself or for one's constituency. Uh, it tends to kind of conceptualize political will, popular, uh, popular will, as anti in an anti-pluralist way. That's kind of a singular will of the people that's embodied in the leader. It often has very specific techniques of governance that others have written about, colonizing the state bureaucracy with, uh, with essentially um, allies, uh, mass clientelism, handing out goodies to supporters, uh, which to some degree is part of democratic politics, but it has a more nefarious form in authoritarian uh, politics and what's called discriminatory legalism, using the letter of the law unequally across groups. <coughs> it often leads to very dangerous developments, like the de delegitimization of the opposition, of the political opposition as the enemy of the state. You've heard that before. I, that wasn't actually a facetious remark about the United States. That was, you know, I was talking about Hungary in my mind, but yes, the, you've heard it here too. <coughs> I heard, I'm just reacting to the, to the Snickers. Uh, <laughs> The persecution of civil society, right? Saying protesters are hired, they're doing it for money. Um, threats to judicial autonomy and to media autonomy. And ultimately, the final thing, removing the final levers through which people can be removed from office by way of unfair elections. 
And when I say Hungary, this, a lot of this has already happened in Hungary. Uh, it's happening in Poland, it's happened in Turkey, and it may happen elsewhere. Now, the repertoire of these authoritarian strategies has diffused across countries because leaders learn from one another. When it works in one place, they figure out, oh, we can do something similar here, even if they disagree on ideology, actually. So Kaczynski in Poland copies Orban in Hungary, even though they actually have different allies uh, and they don't fully agree on a lot of things, but they certainly agree on how to stay in power. And Orban borrowed a lot of stuff from Erdogan, uh, with whom he also doesn't agree on a lot of things. Doesn't matter, right? The techniques work. The implication of seeing authoritarianism this way um, is that it's rarely articulated as an ideology. It's really a set of governance practices and a collection of this kind of diffuse beliefs about uh, appropriate norms. Um, like populism, it t tends not to be a source of strong identity, but it can be justify justified by anti-elite appeals and nationalist beliefs too. Politically, it's among the most dangerous aspects of radical right politics because it can lead to the erosion of democratic institutions through which people can be removed from office, which is fundamentally the most important thing about democracy, right? People's will can be heard and you have transition of power. Authoritarianism uh, appends that. Now, I would argue that nationalism is most dangerous in terms of uh, civil rights, egalitarian norms, and group relations. We can talk about that. Okay, so I've told you about the three aspects of national, uh, of radical right politics. Um, they're distinct components, but they're bundled together very often. They're bundled together in political claims making, and they're bundled together sometimes in people's conceptions of, of political uh, decision making. Why are they bundled together? Well, it's partly because they actually do some work for one another. So I'm not gonna go through this whole thing, but I'll just give you one example. If, as I mentioned to you, populism is about opposing some sort of a corrupt elite with a virtuous people, who are the people, right? These, these are often kind of ambiguous categories, often captured in speech by just saying we. Right? or people like us. And nationalism helps fill in that, that, uh, that category. Right? So if for some populists, those who are also ethno-nationalists, the people may be white, may be Christian, and so forth. For in India, they may be Hindu. Right? So th there are different kind of dominant group relations that are often come into play. And similarly, there are other linkages between all three of these aspects of radical politics, which I won't get into. But the point is that they go together well because they have certain elective affinities that make them click and make them work. Uh, and I'm working on a paper actually that shows that in Europe over the course of the last 30 years, 39 years now, um, parties played around with each one of these components kind of in a, in a trial and error way. When it worked, it stuck. They tried another one, it stuck. Eventually they developed some kind of a winning strategy, a winning formula that then diffused across countries of how to combine these three components of radical politics. Just to give you an example from the United States that, that these things are distinguishable, you know, one contrast is between the Republican and Democratic National Conventions in 2016, which offered a very different vision of the nation. Uh, one about sort of walling off the nation against immigrants, the other one celebrating kind of the uh, immigrant uh, heritage of the, of, of the United States. Um, interestingly, the Democratic National Convention borrowed a lot of old Republican tropes from past Republican National Conventions. Again, this is not just a partisan issue. Um, in terms of uh, Donald Trump's speech, there are also distinct kind of uh, cues along these three uh, aspects of radical politics, right? So in terms of his nationalism, the famous quote about Mexico sending, not sending good people, but sending rapists and so forth. Um, about America first, America first. Protect our borders from the ravages of other countries, right? Um, at the bedrock of our politics will be a total allegiance to the United States of America. Loyalty to country, loyalty to each other. This one, for anyone who studies nationalism, was a little uh, disheartening. When you open your heart to patriotism, there's no room for prejudice. Um, it depends how you define patriotism, but um, some forms of patriotism, maybe. Other, um, another one, if uh, you have some, you know, the, the, re the reaction to Charlottesville, right? Pe good, pe you know, people, good people on both sides. I'm showing these not to do anything other than to show you that nationalism can exist on its own, right, as an analytically separate category. Populism, too, can stand on its own, right? <laughs> the, the, the speech where he talks about the fact that Americans will have the chance to redeclare their independence, um, vote for trade, immigration, and foreign policies that put our citizens first, and reject today's rule by the global elite, right? That's a populist claim. That's an anti-elite claim. Um, not doesn't matter which party controls government, but whether government is controlled by the people, right? The people will again become the rulers of this nation, which they haven't been, presumably, right? Um, now, some hints of authorita authoritarianism. Again, I mentioned this is a governance strategy, but often it's signaled by, by politicians to show that, hey, I'm willing to do this for you, 
in, in, you know, in our common cause. Um, so, you know, the fact that courts are political and uh, it would be so great if they could just do what's right. Um, so sort of challenging autonomy of the courts, the, the kind of nostalgia over being able to punch protesters in the face, uh, the stuff about fake news, which is kind of a, a challenge to autonomous uh, news media and so forth. Again, I'm not evaluating these claims. I'm just showing you the analytical separ separability, uh, separability of, these, of these claims, the three types of claims. Okay, so that's what I would argue, and that's what I think there's some consensus about in the literature, what the radical right is. It helps us understand where it's coming from, potentially, which I'll get to next. Uh, it helps us classify who might belong to the radical right category, who, who does not. Why has it been surging? Well, this is a million dollar question, and I don't have a million dollars. But I have an, an answer, which is always partial, um, but, but it's based on, on empirical research. So I would argue, in a nutshell, that nationalist cleavages are, are the fuel for the rise of radical right politics. Anti-elitism and low institutional trust, that's kind of part and parcel of populism, uh, stoke the fire. And what, what the result is, is tolerance for authoritarian rule. Or greater tolerance, not absolute tolerance. But in all cases, in the case of all three components, the beliefs are not as that sort of in the aggregate changing very much and the frames have been around for a while. What's really changed are the conditions in which these beliefs and, and, and political uh, frames resonate. And what's interesting is the, the fact that in the aggregate attitudes have not altered in most democratic countries. That is, people are not becoming more racist, they're not becoming more xenophobic, right? They're not becoming more Islamophobic on average. All these trends slope downwards or are stable. And yet, here we are. So that's a puzzle. So I want to argue that we need to be thinking about resonance. That is, under what conditions do old frames and old attitudes that did not resonate before resonate now? Um, I could get into this kind of dif this discussion of what resonance means in sociology. The bottom line is people used to think as long as you have a frame and a belief that correspond to each other, boom, there goes mobilization. That's no longer really believed, right? The evidence of the same frames and the same beliefs go along and not resonate and not result in mobilization until the conditions become ripe and they kind of start um, working together. Um, this resonance, this newfound resonance, is partly about grievances stemming from rapid social and cultural change. And I want to be really clear here. Some of the changes are very real. Some of the changes are perceived. And it's sometimes hard to know which one's which for people. Um, there are changes that impact group status in a status hierarchy within the country. A lot of these changes are experienced directly by people, like for example, when people are living in the industrialized Midwestern towns, for example, and their jobs are at risk or they've already lost their job. That's a directly experienced shock. But others are mediated. So you might be doing fine, but people like you, fill in the blanks, might not be, and you think that because of the media, but also through social networks, you know, maybe it's like you know, your cousin's best friend a few states over who's not doing okay, but somehow they belong in a similar category to you, uh, however you fill that in. Often there are sociotropic com concerns. That, that is, again, not concerns with your own individual well-being, but the well-being of your group. It's about life chances, about dignity, and about moral commitments. These changes generate fears, a whole bunch of fears, anxieties, that on their own don't do a whole lot other than make people worried. But these fears are often very opportunistically ch uh, channeled by political elites into outgroup resentments through blame attribution, right? You're suffering because of them, whoever they might be. And so the they are often elites, that's the populist piece, but they're also ethnic, racial, and religious outgroups of various sorts. Again, some changes are real, some are perceived. This is a key thing. So what might these changes be? And this is getting back to this argument I made earlier that these explanations can't be monocausal. There are multiple factors at play. And in fact, it's the perfect storm of multiple factors that often results in the resonance of radical right political claims. So obviously, they're economic, right? We, that's undisputable. Um, they are partly about economic crises, but also about deindustrialization and so forth. They're also demographic in a sense of immigration itself changing in levels or new destinations, but also importantly, the perception of immigration being a problem changing. They're about national security. They're about people's fear about terrorism, for example which again, opportunistic elites often bundle in with immigration in ways that make the two doubly um, uh, fear generating. 
It's about changes in opportunity structures and you know, campaigns like uh, affirmative action policies. Why would that be bundled with the other features I just mentioned? There's no inherent logical connection. But there is one if you think that all of these things affect your group and its status in, uh, in a hierarchy of, of status um, in, a, in a nation. <laughs> this is, you know, this is, this is important. There were people in this country who thought that they were at the core of the nation and they don't see themselves as represented that way in full popular culture anymore because the popular culture has changed. Again, I'm not making a normative judgment about this. I'm just saying that it's something that people perceive. I'm not saying Hollywood is purely egalitarian and cosmopolitan. It's not. But the face of popular culture has changed, right? It's also about changes in the political sphere, like the election of the first black president. His election by many Republican leaners, too right, who then voted for Donald Trump later. So that's an interesting thing we could talk about. It's about social movements like Black Lives Matter, movements for social justice and equality. All of these things together create a sense of threat. Um, so this is going to be the, the theoretical model in a nutshell. We should care about the supply side, that is what claims are politicians making and the demand side, what are people's beliefs. There are these three components, nationalism, populism, and authoritarianism. What happens over time is not a whole lot. There's a lot of stability. But if you dig a little deeper, things are happening. So on the side of, of attitudes, you've got partisan sorting, which I already mentioned. The fact that the, the, in the aggregate, the beliefs are stable, but they're sorting across parties, which is a big deal. On the discourse side, these parties, like the ones in Europe I mentioned, are recombining these three components in new ways and finding a winning formula. They're also fusing them. So I've got this one experimental uh, project that shows that if you prime people with just populism, just empty elite rhetoric, they're likely to have stronger antipathies towards minorities. That is, populism has become a dog whistle or a stand-in for nationalism for some sub subsets of the population. So that's what's happening on the demand and supply side. At the same time, you've got these structural shocks, both real and perceived, that are creating fears that are then channeled into resentments by political elites, which is creating a sense of status threat, typically to white majorities dominant majorities within countries. In the meantime, you've got the erosion of other identities like old labor identities that were giving people meaning and a sense of collective self. That nationalism then be starts filling in. It creates an identity vacuum The nationalism fills in. When all of this kind of boils together, what you end up getting is a newfound resonance between pre-existing beliefs and pre-existing frames, um, which then leads to the mobilization of these otherwise latent nationalist cleavages, which then breeds the success of radical right politicians. And the whole thing diffuses because people learn from one another, people meaning political elites, and a lot of white majorities are experiencing, experiencing similar real and perceived changes across the different countries that I'm talking about. Okay, that's a quick explanation of why it might be surging. Um, I'm happy to entertain questions and critiques. What are its consequences? And this is, Chris is gonna get into a lot more of this uh, in a little bit. Is liberal democracy in peril? Um, there are certainly warning signs. There is a risk of crisis, and, and the crisis has different, different sort of components to it, each bred by a different aspect of radical politics. So authoritarianism has a different set of consequences around institutional norms, democratic institutional norms. Uh, uh, nationalism is really about group uh, uh, interactions and sort of the ability of, of, um, of egalitarian policies to be passed. Uh, and then populism is really about kind of changing the way we do political talk and political debate in, in the country, right? Fake news and so forth and the lack of trust in, in elites and expertise. Um, how this works out in terms of democratic stability differs with the strength of institutions. And of course, uh, Americanist political scientists always thought, well, the U.S. is the most stable institution, so we don't need to worry. Uh, then sort of the pecking order is, well, Western Europe is not bad, so that's going to be fine. It's really Eastern Europe that's a problem. Hungary, Poland, see, I told you about those, those countries. Well, <laughs> I think political scientists, Americanists are getting more and more worried. If you've read the, the Ziblatt and Levitsky uh, book, uh, How Democracies Die, that was a kind of a call to arms for American as political scientists. Um, but also, uh, people are getting more and more worried about the UK, right? Again, it's always hard to know when to ring the alarm bells, but they're just signals of potential trouble. Um, there are really two, di two different dangers. One is what's potentially a gradual transition to what's called uh, competitive authoritarianism. That is essentially autocratic governance, but with elections. And those elections look like they're real, but they're not leading to real change in terms of transition of power, right? They're ceremonial elections. That's a, that's a challenge in a lot of countries, um, and hopefully not in the US. It can also lead to geopolitical instability, 
Um, because geopolitical crises, well, first of all, a lot of the people who get elected in radical right parties have no experience in, in foreign policy and geopolitics. Uh, they get into power, they make all kinds of mistakes. That can create all kinds of crises. Those crises can become opportunities for changing the rules back home, right? So in states of emergency, all of a sudden, executives can do things that they couldn't otherwise in terms of you know, uh, civil liberties and, and democratic norms. So it's sort of a, the potential feedback effects. And again, I already told you about some of the dangers about judicial autonomy, media independence, constitutional continuity, peaceful transitions of power, tolerating the, other, uh, the opposition as legitimate rather than the enemy of the state, uh, civil liberties, what Levitsky and Ziblatt, uh, Levitsky and Ziblatt call uh, procedural forbearance, that is not doing everything you can to the opposition, right? Like Nixon was pardoned for a reason, country over party, right? We need to, con to have kind of continued respect for the other side and not uh, prosecute every person that just left office. Um, and again, geopolitical and amateurism. This stuff is fueled by polarization, by norm erosion, and the delegitimization of existing institutions and parties. Um, and Turkey, Hungary, and Poland are sort of worst, worst case scenarios already. Um, but in the US, there are danger signs, right? In terms of mutual toleration of the parties and procedural forbearance, threats to prosecute Clinton, firing of Comey, Mueller's dismissal, uh, blocking the Supreme Court nominee of, of uh, Barack Obama, stacking of federal courts, and so forth. It's always tricky, and political scientists have had trouble with this, to distinguish what is just partisan politics as usual, which is fine and should be encouraged, and what is the erosion of democratic norms. And it's not always clear to tell. It's not always easy to tell where that boundary is. But there's certainly some danger signs that the boundary is go, go, moving too far. Um, potential disregard of election results has been threatened, verbal attacks on journalists, the whole fake news thing, uh, delegitimi delegitimization of protesters uh, and attempts to undermine courts and law enforcement. All of these things are worrisome. It's, most of them have been threats, not actual practices, but they're worrisome. And then what, again, is called discriminatory legalism, using the existing letter of the law against some groups more than others. Uh, again, where is the boundary between politics as usual and potentially authoritarian politics is up for debate, but they're danger signs. This is the partisan part, but it's not partisan from my partisan identity. The point is, there's a lot of research on this. Daniel Zablat's done terrific research. The, the partisan faction that has the greatest influence on preventing this stuff from going awry is the center right, historically. Because the attack often comes from the radical right, which is not mainstream politics. And the center right has a real problem. Do you separate itself from the radical right? Do you draw a cordon sanitaire? You can only do that for so long if the radical right has a lot of support. Do you kind of buy into their way of doing politics a little bit, hoping that you're going to get some of their voters? Or do you embrace them all together? And so the, radical, sorry, the center right, which is the mainstream Republican Party and the center right parties in Europe, is in a really tight spot. But historically, in Europe, at least, when the center right cedes that territory to the radical right, very bad things happen. So there is culpability for the current conditions on both the left and the right, and we can talk about sort of how parties have screwed up in the past, um, but the center right is often the bulwark against the incursion of authoritarianism into, into democratic politics. Net of these political transformations, and I know I've got to wrap up, there are also dangers for just everyday interactions, right? For the, ability of people to feel secure in their own country. And this is typically the case for minority groups for whom all of a sudden rights protections erode and who are seeing certain interactions be permissible that weren't permissible just a little bit ago. And I, you know, there are a lot of uh, reports of greater hate crimes uh, after Brexit in England, um, after radical right elections in other European countries, after the Trump election in 2016, that people are all of a sudden saying, well, hey, you know, my leaders can say that, so can I. And maybe I can actually act the way that I've always wanted to act, but I kind of didn't want to. You know, I, didn't, I thought it wasn't appropriate, but now it's appropriate. So norm erosion has implications for individual interactions on the street and group uh, interactions. Um, and the, the, the additional problem is that once you open up this can of worms, it's very hard to close it up, right? So once nationalism becomes the currency of politics, everybody kind of has to play that game. And it's very difficult to, to lower the salience of nationalism and start talking about policy again or start talking about, you know, agreeing and coming to some sort of a consensus. When the two parties can't agree what America means and elections are being fought about what America means, that's a real problem, right? It creates the condition of possibility for future success of radical right politicians um, and potentially much more effective ones than the ones we've seen so far. 
So all of this suggests that radical right politics is here to stay. This talk series, if it was organized in three or four years, we'd still probably have something to talk about. But I'm glad that we did it this year. Um, whether liberal democracy remains unscathed really depends on the con commitment to institutional norms, uh, especially by center right, right parties, uh, and then the magnitude of potential security crises coming our way. So I've showed you, uh, and I'm going to wrap up with this, why it's important to have a local clarity in these categories, how to think about supply, demand, and resonance between these different aspects of radical politics, and how to think about changes in context that make pre-existing frames and beliefs resonate. The last thing I'll say, I mentioned that we need to think about multi-causal accounts and about case specificity. So I just want to end by saying that if you look at the cases in Europe, they're all very different, okay, and the United States. So the election of Donald Trump in the US arguably is about immigration, it's about race, it's about other things that I've talked about. If you think about Brexit, it, some people think it was about, about Islamophobia. It really wasn't primarily about that. It was actually about a protest against a large scale immigration from Poland, from within the EU. It wasn't about race, it was about ethnicity and culture. Later, toward the end of the Brexit campaign, Islamophobia kind of started creeping in. But it's really about intra-EU migration, very different sort of, sort of, uh, kind of initial conditions. Um, if you think about Northern and Western Europe, I've got a paper on this as well, on attitudes around uh, Muslims in Northern and Western Europe. In Northern and Western Europe, civic nationalism, the good stuff, right, has been turned on its head. So that now, one of the justifications for opposing uh, migration from Muslim-majority countries is the protection of women's rights and gay rights in the Netherlands, in Sweden, in Norway, right? The idea is we are progressive, and therefore, Muslims' values are incompatible with ours, so let's keep them out. Think about that for a second, right? This is actually turning civic inclusive nationalism toward exclusion, which is a really powerful uh, strategy because it actually ends up appealing to both the left and the right potentially um, and, and it sort of engages with very fundamental inclusive kind of uh, principles toward exclusion. And then finally, an example from Poland, these are cases I, I write about um, and will be writing about in the forthcoming book. Um, you've got Islamophobia without Muslims and anti-Semitism without Jews which is really amazing, right? This is a largely homogenous country, but yet the fear of the other is fundamentally powerful. This is combined with all kinds of kind of nostalgic nationalism around uh, foreign incursions and so forth. But again, a very different kind of configuration than elsewhere. But yet, in all four cases, I would argue, the mechanisms are similar. It goes through the sense of, of threat that's channeled into outgroup resentment and activates collect collective status threat among majorities that then leads to radical right support in these new conditions. So if there is a takeaway from all this, it is that to understand what's driving radical politics, we should really take populism, nationalism, and authoritarianism seriously. Not just as sort of sources of definitional problems, not just as nuisances, but as actually analytically meaningful categories in their own right. And we should place nationalism at the very center of our explanation. Thank you. As we uh, set up for uh, Q&A, a reminder to text your questions to the, the firm and advanced students there will uh, collect them. I'm going to ask a few questions uh, myself, um, but then uh, the students ask, uh, ask questions. Uh, I'll start with you, Chris. Um, we heard from Dr. Bonikowski on an academic perspective on why current trends in nationalism, populism, and authoritarianism present dangers for our democracy and democracies uh, throughout the world. From your perspective as someone who's had a long career in military intelligence, are these trends concerning to folks, folks like you who are responsible for our nation's security? Wow, thank you. I appreciate that very much. Um, great talk. Thank you very much. Um, you know, certainly I can't necessarily speak for the intelligence community anymore <laughs> um, in the last month or so, so having retired. But, but I, I can say that, that yes, it is a, a, a considerable concern, I think, uh, throughout the national security establishment for a couple of reasons and, and in some cases different reasons. Um, the first I would offer is that at least since the end of World War II, part of our national um, security strategy has been a foundation of alliances. 
that our ability to take care of America, to do what's right for our nation, has meant us partnering with other nations in the world um, with like values, with like, um, with like perspectives. And, and I think there is a concern that uh, a, an America first approach that sends, starts to alienate some of those allies makes it much more challenging for our national security system, our defense establishment. The other th way I think that we are very concerned, and it clearly came out in, in, in Bart's talk and the discussions of the, uh, certainly elections here in the United States, but elections that are going on throughout Europe and in South America and others, is that we have now begun to see that in this information age, there are an awful lot of foreign actors um, who see the discourse and find opportunities to exploit, to influence, um, and to, for their own national security purposes, um, get involved in our internal discourse. Um, and that really is a concern because a lot of these issues that, that uh, we face today, we've certainly faced before as a nation. The civil rights movement, um, uh, the civil war, a number of other things in which we've, we have a nation have gone through these things, but we've been able to sort it out ourselves ultimately as a nation and come to a path forward. We see now foreign actors wanting to get involved in our internal politics and shape those, that discussion in ways that ultimately um, seeds distrust amongst ourselves, uh, that causes us to start having losing faith in our institutions. And that's a deliberate effort by foreign actors. And that, to me, is a, is a national security concern that we must um, be able to uh, address and continue to focus on. Dr. Bernikowski, uh, Dr. Andrea Swimer, who's a noted sociologist, says that nationalism has provided the ideological foundation for insti important institutions, such as democracy, the welfare state, and public education. This sounds like an important part of democracy, nationalism. Uh, are you saying that, that nationalist uh, tendencies are bad for democracy? No, I think um, it's, it's um, dangerous to sort of think about these as either good or bad, right? Is nationalism good or bad? Is populism good or bad? It depends which nationalism and for what ends. And so it's uh, undisputably true that a sense of collective community is a fundamentally important aspect of nationhood and of being, uh, and, and governance, right? In order to govern, uh, for a state to govern a nation, there has to be a sense of, of being in, in this together as a community. Um, the question is what principles is that togetherness based on? Uh, and in what way is, are particular forms of nationalism used politically? And so, you know, for me, the fact that in the 90s, again, Republicans and Democrats agreed in large part about what America means. They may have disagreed with w among one, uh, one another, among Democrats, among Republicans, but there was the same kind of variation in beliefs in the two parties. That's healthy, right? We can come together around some sort of a compromise uh, on, on issues of policy and, and so forth. Once the parties disagree fundamentally, then we've got a problem. Uh, and once one particular form of nationalism is weaponized by radical right actors, typically in bad faith, then dangers loom potentially. So no, nationalism as a whole is not a bad thing. It's part and parcel of, of, of modern democracy. Um, it's just that there are certain forms of it that are more nefarious than others, especially when they're used for, for you know, radical right kind of insight. General Ballard, how are um, you know, enemies of the United States using uh, you know, changes in technology, social media, um, and even the, the civil liberties we have in the United States to you know, threaten democracy here? There were some interesting discussions that, uh, there's interesting points that uh, Dr. Bonikowski made about how in some authoritarian states they look at democratic institutions as being particularly vulnerable um, and, and exploitable. And, and I think there, are, there has been a rise in those folks who have looked at our own democratic institutions and have watched the discord and said these are ripe for, um, for, for manipulation. And, and so that to me I think is, is part of a larger issue that we've got to be careful of. It gets back ultimately to his point about what people perceive as fears and threats. Um, and in an age of globalization, of an, of an information age, um, there are a lot of folks that are um, finding themselves on the outside 
of the progress that's being made in their societies. You know, there's, there, there will be an election this Sunday um, in, in uh, Brandenburg and in Saxony, two states in the German uh, Republic. Uh, these are state elections, and these are parts of uh, former East Germany, uh, and, and they're both coal producing and coal energy um, a large part of the economy in those states. And there's a real concern amongst coal miners there that in a German state that has declared that it will move away from coal energy, that they're going to be left out, that they're going to be left behind. That sounds pretty familiar to some of the discussions we've heard in our own country, where people see that their livelihood may be in jeopardy because of the changes and advancements that are going on in the world. And so how do you find a way for those folks to not have to resort to more extremist politics to see themselves be able to, 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 to survive, to stay afloat. Um, there's a far right uh, nascent party there, the Alternatives Party for Germany, uh, which could considerably uh, take a majority of the vote in both of those states. And, and the, the, the Christian Democrats, the right centrist party that you spoke about, has been the leading political party in those states since the end of um, the division of Germany, since they became all one country. And, and they have, up to this point, completely um, rejected the AFD's, um, uh, any type of, of, of governing with the AFD, but they may have to now after these elections on Sunday because they can no longer ignore the fact that this far-right party is increasing in popularity. Um, that's disconcerting. And it speaks to exactly what, uh, what, uh, what Dr. Bonakowski was speaking about, is how do, we, how do we reduce the amount of fear and threats to people's livelihood as we go forward in this globalized world? Let me just add something to General Ballard's comments. You were asking about their foreign interference in social media as well. Um, it's there, it, it, this is a real threat, and um, I'm very glad to hear that American you know, uh, institutions are, are working on it. Uh, but there, there are problems with reaction to, to the threat from Russia, for instance, on both the left and the right. So for Democrats to say, well, Russia stole the election is misguided, uh, and it leads to people ignoring the real issues that are driving the rise of radicalism in the United States. Russia didn't steal the election. It may have played some minor role, but so did a dozen other things. Um, but the point is that the, the election result was, a, was generated by a large set of structural forces that we need to be cognizant of. And, and it's very easy to just say, oh, it's Russia's fault, and then we can just keep going about business as usual. That's not going to be enough, right? It's equally problematic when the threat of cyber terrorism from, uh, from Russia is ignored altogether um, or welcome, right? That's another kind of problem. Um, and so one of the things that's really interesting about what's been going on over the last couple of years is that there's w one thing is what's being said by the president or the leaders of, of the Republican Party in Congress. And it's another thing, what are the actual institutions doing, right? What, is, what are civil servants doing, career civil servants? What, is, what are security agencies doing? And what's remarkable, actually, about American institutional stability is that despite not having a lot of senior staff in some of the agencies, despite a lot of shakeups, many of the agencies are continuing to do their work and, and, and doing so under the radar. Not all of them. I mean, the, uh, you know, the, 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 there have been a lot of problems um, at HUD. There have been a lot of problems in the Department of Justice. You know, there are certain agencies that the administration is targeting in particular to, to carry out their, um, their agenda or Homeland Security and so forth. But for all those, there are also the other agencies that we don't hear about much that are doing the work, right? And that's, that's actually reassuring. And hopefully that will keep going. Yeah, I, I would offer that you, in the, in the time that I spent at this last year at NSA, that the collaborative work that went on prior to the 2018 midterm elections with FBI, uh, Homeland Defense, with each of the state election commissions to advise and to at least make them aware of the threats that were out there really helped fortify, in many respects, our election processes in good ways that will never really be fully apparent, I think, in the, in the open media. Uh, but it was, uh, it, it is a good news story that those agencies are working towards, towards fortifying those, uh, those processes. I'll ask one more question and then we'll get um, some of the students to, to uh, ask questions. Um, and I would like to you know, hear from, from both of you. Uh, our discussion today has focused on the, the uh, rise of, of radical politics and how the effect that larger societal factors play. Uh, as we'll hear in next week's Straight Talk session, there are important 
demographic changes that are happening um, in this country and in uh, European countries. And in some ways, this is a worldwide phenomenon and what's, what's happening. And it can seem quite overwhelming for an individual citizen. Um, it could even be a little depressing. Um, so uh, my challenge to you is what can we do as citizens to deal with these larger societal global challenges? Good luck. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Um, let me say a word about the demographic changes, first of all. So demographic changes are important in a few different ways. One of them is that the optics. So it's, you know, the, the notion that America is becoming a majority-minority nation. It turns out that that's a very powerful frame that's experimentally been shown to, to, make, to swing people into um, support for radical politics, right? Because it hits really straight to the core of the status threat and group status position that I mentioned around um, race and ethnicity. Um, so that's an interesting feature, and, it, and often it actually, you know, uh, uh, depending how it's framed, it's more or less potent, depending on what time scale is given, uh, and there are all kinds of kind of debates about what it really means for America to become majority minority. Um, there's another aspect of, of dem demographics that's interesting, and that is that as the dem demographics of the United States are changing, a lot has been said about and written about the fact that the, the electoral environment is become, becoming more favorable towards the Democratic Party. Right? And so there's some people who are saying, look, right now things are messy, but let's just wait a little bit, and we're going to get a turnover of power. Democrats can come, can come into office. Everything will be fine. The Republicans will come back, the sane Republicans, and then we'll be back to normal. Um, and uh, uh, <laughs> I mean, not the radical right Republicans, just the center right. Um, so the point is, but that's, that's very dangerous because, first of all, um, a lot of the demographic tr trends are overstated vastly. A lot of the changes happening in urban centers that are already voting Democratic or in states that are already voting Democratic. Uh, and so that demographic change is going to be slow and not as clear as, as people make it out to be. But also, the fear of demographic change from the Republican standpoint creates all kinds of incentives to, to kind of forestall that, that those, those coming transfor transformations of American society. And so that's why you hear a lot about voting rights, right? That's why we're hearing about immigration. Um, these are real existential problems for a party that um, sort of had a lot of options in the early 2000s about which way to go on, on nationalism issues. And there was a very strong voice for, for actually turning the Republican Party toward minority voters. There's a huge captive voting block of conservative, religious voters among minority, you know, Americans of minority backgrounds who are up for grabs. And there was a lot of talk about that. And, you know, the, obviously what happened in 2016 was a you know, big turn away from that. So there's a question. What's going to happen down the pike as, as the Republican Party sort of dealing with demographic changes? What's going to be its strategy? And I think, you know, it's some people see the current moment as kind of the last gasp of white nationalism, right? And then there's going to be a kind of a settle, settling of it. But maybe that's true, maybe not. But in the meantime, institutions are under threat. Um, that's not an answer to your question. <laughs> well, <laughs> General, General Ballard. <laughs> no, I, 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 I would take a, 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 a fairly simple approach, and that is we've got to quit demonizing each other. We have got one of the fundamental parts of American democracy that is that I that I found so, that I find so compelling particularly as, as I've been in other parts of the world is we've got this in incredible ability when we put our minds to it to compromise. We but how can we expect our lawmakers to go into a room and hammer out a a solution on a very complex subject? If they've just spent the last month, you know, spouting four-letter words at each other in, in public discourse, we've got to lower the tenor of the rhetoric so that we can get back to the type of compromising statesmanship that has made us so unique as a nation in the world. Um, I really do think that that's pr pretty important. I, you know, I, I spent two tours in Afghanistan and, and a tour in Iraq, and one of the most disheartening um, observations that I took away from those three years were I, I found a, a, a beautiful people um, giving, gracious, humble, hardworking, and yet for an awful lot of reasons throughout their history, they had come to believe that in their, in their national setting, there are only winners and losers. There are only victors and victims. That there are only oppressors and the oppressed. And if you don't win, you will lose. And that's really, in some ways, how they have 
continue to get in their own way, even though we have worked so hard over the last many years to try to introduce democratic institutions. Democracy's hard. You've got to really work at it. And I, and I believe that if we can tone down the rhetoric and we can begin to talk to each other in a more civil tone, we'll be able to get after some of these problems. These problems are hard. If they were simple solutions, we would have, we would have solved them a long time ago. Um, the other thing I would offer is we can't, we can't presume that there are necessarily simple solutions to these complex problems. If you begin to believe in the 30-second soundbite, but here's the only thing we have to do to solve this problem, then before long, you, you begin to ask, well, if it hasn't happened up to this point, there must be a conspiracy then out there <laughs> that's prevented this from happening. There aren't simple solutions to these problems. They, they're pretty complex, and we're going to have to work through them in, in, in a lot of detail to be able to get after them. But I, I would offer that, I think, as, as something that we can do um, that, that can make a difference as we go forward. Thank you. I should just let it stand at that. <laughs> but I can't. <laughs> the reason I can't is not because I disagree. I agree fundamentally. I, I, I fully agree. The problem is that the crisis of civility in our politics, it's not a crisis of disposition. It's not that people are choosing to be more vile than it could otherwise be. I mean, maybe at some individual level. The problem is that structurally, our politics has become absolutely polarized. Uh, what that means is that issues have become, all, virtually all policy issues have become partisan, sorted by party, by party ID, which never used to be the case, including nationalism, which I talked about today, which then in, has increased the importance of partisan identity to people, right? So that whether you're Republican or Democrat, um, it's becoming more and more important to your sense of self over time. Um, and that's created what's called in political science negative partisanship or, or, um, or effective polarization. That is, it used to be the case that we could sit around a dinner table with somebody of, the, of, a, of a different party and have a normal conversation. Disagree, but that's great. Disagreement is fantastic. But, but still, you know, drink our coffee or wine or whatever um, and have a meal. Over time, that's become more and more difficult because there's a sense in which people from the opposing party are the enemy, right? And empirically, this has been demonstrated. This has been growing over time. And there's less of this cross-cutting set of issues around which we can have constructive uh, um, arguments. And so the reason why we're seeing the lack of civility and the lack of consensus is that there's a lot of incentive not to participate in that kind of dialogue because it actually leads to electoral gains. And that's a huge problem, and it's a problem that's a, that's a structural problem. Um, and I don't have a solution to it because, because it's such a tough problem, but I will say in terms of nationalism itself, what I would hope for in upcoming elections is for the salience of nationalist rhetoric to decline, right? Let's stop arguing about American national identity and who we are, and let's argue about other things, about policies, about things that we can actually have a conversation about. Um, and that is hard to do again because it's ultimately a structural issue. Uh, but, you know, but campaigns make choices, right? You can offer an alternative, whether it's, a, it's another Republican uh, uh, candidate that can offer a different vision of what we should be arguing about, or whether it's Democrats who are either going to choose to play along in the nationalist game or offer something else. Or maybe there is some hope that we can come back to a type of nationalism, to come back to the question about democracy, democracy and nationalism, that we can all buy into which has been, had been the case in the past. There was a lot of consensus among the two parties about what America meant in the past. That's what drove a lot of the, the compromise uh, and consensus in foreign policy. Foreign policy was one area of policy where, where partisan differences mattered very little historically because everybody bought the need for, America to, uh, for the United States to be a global leader and, it created, and the United States created a global order that it then was the custodian of. That itself is eroding, right? So the question is how do we get back to a consensus around who, about who we are, or, or at least the, the lowering of the salience of the disagreements about who we are. I think that's the challenge for the upcoming election. Here are some of the uh, questions that you texted uh, to the advanced team. All right, Dr. Bonikowski, I'm gonna start. Um, first off, thank you for your wonderful presentation. One of our audience members has a question, and it is, assuming optimal global Global goals are better than optimal national goals. What are two or three things that we would that would need to occur for globalism to be a success? 
Glad that went to you. <laughs> yeah. Would you like to start? It's <laughs> a great question. Um, there's so many ways you could start talking about this um, because one of the arguments about the rise of radical politics is its reaction to global capitalism, right, and sort of unfettered global markets and the erosion of national sovereignty. And so that's one way one can take it. That's sort of part of what, in some ways, part of what I already talked about, so I'm not going to do that. But I will say that there are a growing number of existential issues that cannot be addressed at the national level but must be addressed at the global level. And obviously climate change is one of them. I think young people, and I don't want to speak for all the young people in the audience, but a lot of young people are extremely frustrated with the fact that this obvious issue is a deeply partisan one. And in fact, it, there, are no, there are no angels on either side. You know, one party kind of plays uh, lip service to environmental issues, the other one partly rejects it, partly pays lip service. This is an issue that's existential and around which there should be global cooperation. It should become, you know, one of the main issues that we're talking about at, at the global level. But that's not happening. And in fact, we're seeing nationals get in the way. So the burning Amazon, which we talked about over dinner today, nationalism is an important aspect of this, both in terms of potentially how the fire started, although that's less clear, but certainly in, in, in what the fires mean and what the reaction, to, you know, what, what might be a solution to them. And when a radical right politician refuses money on nationalist grounds, it, you know, it becomes kind of problematic. Eventually, all, all, you know, he took some money, just required Macron to apologize, fine, it's kind of politics of dominance, whatever. But that is not enough, right? Like we need, glo we need real global solutions to this fundamentally important problem. And there are other problems like that. So, so there's another aspect of, of globalization or globalism which is about solving problems together. And I think the time is really uh, uh, right now for, for getting at some of these issues. And, you know, and security is another one which, which General Ballard knows a lot about. So I'll punt it over to you. I mean, I think the, the Amazon is a perfect, you know, bellwether right now. You know, this is something that as much as Brazil has a sovereignty claim and has a rightful place to determine what happens within its own borders, it has global implication. And, and we've got to be able to have a discourse that allows us to do that. Um, it, you, you, you mentioned something earlier that I, that I, that I thought was pretty interesting. We talked about symbolic borders. Um, one of the interesting dilemmas and areas where the Defense Department now is 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 moving forward is how do we de how do we decide what is the purview of the Defense Department? It used to be that our borders, our shores, were a pretty clear indication of where our defense needed to be. Uh, that we were built we built a defense establishment to protect turf. But now in a globalized world where any number of nefarious foreign actors can get into our banking system, who can get into um, and exploit or hold hostage medical records in our health system, who can actually begin to tinker with and tamper with the FAA, um, flight control systems, um, how um, driverless cars, um, train switches, you name it, then where does the, the boundary between the defense establishment and the homeland defense, mm. where, does that, where does that go? At what point do our responsibilities to defend the nation against all enemies, foreign and domestic, cross the lines of what we traditionally understood as uh, focused on foreign adversaries uh, overseas? So there's, those are the, some of the, 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 the national security implications that we're working through right now. Fortunately, in my view, and certainly in my experience of the last couple of years, the relationship that we've had with FBI, with the Department of Justice, from the Defense Department standpoint, and with the Homeland Defense has been very, very good. And it's not a matter of who owns what necessarily, and we work very hard with, with, with the, the Attorney General to make sure that we're not uh, stepping out in the areas where we're not supposed to, but we work very, very hand in hand to cover all the bases from a national security standpoint. But, but the sense of what it was to be in the Defense Department 20 years ago is very different than what it means today. And it's going to continue to change as those symbolic borders continue to ebb and flow and change. Dr. Benikowski and Major General Ballard, do you personally believe the current administration is radical or has the media framed them as such while they are collectively implementing much needed remedies to democracy? 
I'm smiling only because I knew this was coming. <laughs> Look, there, it's much easier to point out radicalism elsewhere than at home. It's much easier to point out nationalism elsewhere than at home, that it's somebody else's problem. Um, so I guess the question would be, well, if you look at the leaders in, in, in Europe that I, that I sort of talked about, which, around which there's quite a bit of consensus in literature, about whom there's consensus in literature as being radical right, do they seem to match that description based on the definition I provided for you? If, if the answer is yes, then I would say, well, taking a close look at home is important. Um, and, and, you know, the, the radicalism of Donald Trump as a candidate and of the Trump administration has been, that sort of that class classification is based on the things that he said in the campaign and some of the things that he's done since coming into the office. But not everything, right? Again, as I said during the talk, a lot of things that are happening are things that any other Republican president would do, and that's fine, right? That's how it should be. The question is, where is the, where is the line? Um, you know, I've sat around, I've had the privilege of sitting around the table with, with policy makers and policy elites from both parties, not quite as often as General Ballard has, but, but I did cherish those few opportunities. And I was always amazed that you had people who worked in Republican administrations and Democratic administrations who agree on the fundamental principles of American democracy and who are equally worried about where we are today. So again, it's not a partisan issue. The vilification of the media, the vilification of, of the courts, the requests to punch protesters in the face, the vilification of civil society, that's not democracy as usual. Saying, hey, maybe I'd love a third term, that's not democracy as usual. Saying, ah, I'll see what I'll do when, uh, my, if my opponent gets elected, maybe, maybe there'll be an insurrection, that's not democracy as usual. Okay, saying for the Republican, for a leader of the Republican Party to say that his role model is Putin and cozying up to Russia, is, that would be unthinkable in the Republican Party of 10 years ago, five years ago, right? Um, to, so, so there's certain sort of behaviors and certain, certain um, frames that are being used that are, I think, quite surprising to a lot of Republican and Democratic um, um, politicians, career civil servants, and so forth. Um, so at the same time, let me, let me give you the flip side of this uh, very briefly. Um, again, much like nationalism is not inherently bad, populism is also not inherently bad. Populism can be kind of a barometer of deep-seated um, you know, uh, anxieties and, and, and problems. The fact that the United States post-recovery, the recovery only worked for the top uh, you know, income earners and didn't work at all for the bottom income earners, that's a problem, right? So there are real causes. You know, when I showed you all those kind of shocks and, and structural problems, I said some are, some are real, some are, some are um, uh, perceived. But many, again, are real and they have to be dealt with. So if we see sort of populist unrest as, as a sign of trouble, that's good, right? That trouble is real and it needs to be addressed. But I don't think it should be addressed at the cost of democratic norms and institutions. If, if you're succumbing to radical politics, I think we are in part to blame. We have been gifted a pretty remarkable demo, liberal democratic experiment um, over the last 250 some odd years that is not a given, it's not automatic, um, you got to work hard at it, and it, you can't be lazy um, in a democracy. Um, I had a dear friend locally who, um, who, who left an Obama sticker on her car, and three times now that sticker's been vandalized in Greenville. How is it that we can get to a point in our politics where we think that's acceptable? Um, we can't. Um, we have an obligation uh, to treat each other with respect and to hear each other out, and we have an obligation to uh, let our democratic processes work the way they were intended to work. As an officer in the United States Army, I swore an oath to defend the Constitution of the United States. Not a person, not a party, not an ethnic group, not a gender. Um, it was to the Constitution of the United States. And to me, if there is a nationalism, if there is a national identity that I think is powerful for us is we look at the Constitution of what are the values that we believe in, what are the values that we champion across the globe, and what are the things that we are willing to die for. That's what we've got to be able to focus on, not defacing someone else's bumper sticker.
Well, I would uh, definitely like to thank our guests. Uh, before closing tonight, I would like to invite you all to come back. Uh, next Thursday, here in, uh, here in Yance, is the next session of the Straight Talk series. The topic is multiculturalism in the future of white identity. While there are no seats available for the public for week two, students, there are still seats for you and you need your CLPs. Um, so I will see you here next week. Uh, week three, we still have plenty of room for the public and students for Derek Black's presentation, which will, again will be in McAllister Auditorium. So please plan to come and you can register on uh, the Riley Institute's website. Please join me one more time in thanking our guests.